All right, yeah, so this is energy. So this lecture, this is lecture three. We're going to title this energy and dimensional analysis. Three energy and dimensional analysis. Nemo, did you have a question? Okay. So in this lecture, we're going to talk about energy, the units of energy, um, the various types of energy. Probably tomorrow we're going to get to temperature and we'll also probably get to specific heat. We'll get to that tomorrow or Friday. So the first thing I want to talk to you guys about is this law of conservation of energy. of conservation of energy. So scientific law, scientific law is something that scientists will see over and over and over. They also will see it throughout time and different people will see the same thing. So like the law of gravity is, for example, no matter how many times I drop something, it's always going to fall to the ground, whether it's 2019 or 2,519. It's going to be the same. Dare I say a law is similar to a scientific fact, but I don't like the word fact because you should always question science. There are no facts in chemistry. Unless it upsets. Like you said, if you catch it, it will fall to the ground. True. You're right. But it will fall towards the center of the earth. You're right. So the law of conservation of energy states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. So energy cannot be created or destroyed. Um, so it can't be created, it can't be destroyed, but as you guys know, energy is in a lot of different forms. And so what that means, it can not be created, not be destroyed. It can be only changed. There's a similar law that you may have heard of, just to remind you. Oops. There's the law of conservation of matter. So the law of conservation of matter says the same thing. Um, mass, or matter, anything that has mass and takes up space, also can not be created or destroyed. Um, only rearranged. So, for example, the breakfast that we all ate today is being rearranged right now in our gut. It's going to come out not looking the same way it came in. <laughs> right? Um, you also can look at fossil fuels. Like the gasoline that we put in our car does not look the same as when it came out of our tailpipes. 
So it can't be created, it can't be destroyed, it just can be rearranged. And often a lot of matter is rearranged for the sake of energy, right? For I just gave you two examples. We eat food to gain energy and then we poop it out because that's the waste. Or we put gasoline in our car so that way it has energy to go and then the exhaust is the waste. Um, so I just want you to understand that energy can be changed, the type of energy can be changed, and chemicals can be rearranged often to access that energy or to store that energy. So really these two go hand in hand. So I'd like to talk to you about units of energy. There is something called a joule, and it's abbreviated with a J. You guys think you have heard of a calorie before, but this is a lowercase c calorie. The one that you've heard of before is food calorie, and both are related. Notice it has an uppercase C. That's uppercase. Uh, there's another type that we won't use it. It is a kilowatt hour. So a kilowatt hour is used in our uh, PG&E and SMUD bills. So it's used when we're talking about electricity. Calorie and food calorie are used obviously in the food industry. And then joule is used in all other industries where you're looking at energy production. So joules could be used in mechanical equipment, also electricity generation, things like that. The ones that I want you to be more familiar with, and I'm going to ask you to memorize, is a capital C calorie is really equal to one kilocalorie, which is the same thing as 1,000 little calories. So the breakfast that you had today, let's pretend like you you know, had a piece of toast, and that toast was a grand total of like 150 calories, let's say. What that's saying is you actually ate 150,000 calories. That's what I'm explaining to you right now. You guys realize I'm recording this lecture, so all the chit-chat that's happening, everyone will be hearing it. Thanks. So your class I'm recording today. I, I vary in the classes that I record. <laughs> But yours is it today. So a K calorie is kilo. Kilo stands for a thousand. So the food that we eat, the toast that we had, let's say that was 150 calories. That's actually 150,000 calories. That number is really too big for people to use. So all ca all food calories are actually kilo calories. And honestly, I feel like it's so confusing because lowercase c and uppercase c are very similar, especially if you're handwriting. Um, but just know that all of the calories that you see on the nutritional labels of your food are actually a kilocalorie. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So... Big calorie compared to kilocalorie, which is the same thing as 1,000 little calories. The other one that I want you to know is one little lowercase c calorie is equivalent to 4.184 joules. So I would like for you guys to memorize these. Not too hard to memorize because it's you need to memorize 4.184 and you know over time you'll get used to that and then just memorize that a lowercase c versus an uppercase c the uppercase c is the big guy that means it's more that might help you remember that it's the thousand little calories so if you were let's look at doing conversions with these calories. So 
conversions of energy. So, first of all, I'd like to remind you of the generic way to convert any unit. So, you've got this, what's called the factor label method. It's like a crossbar, and it represents, oops, there you go. This line represents, you'd multiply the left times the right. This line is like a division. But what you put in this, you put whatever the given is. And we'll call that units A. And let's say they're asking you to convert units A into units B. Like, let's say they're asking you to convert inches into feet or joules into calories. So those could be examples. You guys have done quite a few conversions, miles into kilometers. When you do that, what you need is a conversion factor that compares units of your given to units of what you want. So this, like 12 inches for every one foot, right? We call this the conversion factor. So, like I said, one foot equals 12 inches. That's a conversion factor. Or 4.184 joules equals one small calorie. So those are examples. And the whole point of doing that is your units A cancel, and you're left with what you want. And what you want is something in units B. So let's do an example of a problem. If you generated, um, let's say, 500 small calories, Oops, if you generated 500 calories, how many joules is this? So what is the given? Good, 500 calories. Here's our given. What do we want? How many joules, right? We want it. <coughs> this is our want. This is what we want. So now let's plug this in. So we do this. We put our given, right? Just like up here. See our, our little template? Our given is 500 calories. And I know I need a conversion factor that's going to compare calories to joules. And we know this one up here. This one compares calories to joules. So I know that one calorie, I'm going to put that one on the bottom. Why would I want to put that one on the bottom? Yeah, that's what you're dividing by. That way the units cancel. Good. 4.184 joules. So I make sure I set it up correctly. Does someone have a calculator? Could they calculate 500 times 4.184? Nothing. Yeah. Bottom left, did you hear Nemo's question? What's on the bottom left? Nothing. It's an imaginary one if you want. 2,092 exactly? Yeah. Really? Huh. Well, that's lucky. Can I get, yeah, and I got a second on that? Yeah. All right. So this is in joules. Now let's make sure that we have the proper sig figs. So how many is 500? Three. Three, because we have this little decimal here. So it's three sig figs. This one over here, how many is this? Four. Four. Actually, I think it might be one of those weird ones. Let's look. Is joules to calorie an exact number? Um, so 
at number four sig figs? I don't know. That is a good question. Four joules. Yeah, see, so I think it isn't exact. I think it's a measured amount. Yeah. I think the one is exact, but the 4.184 is, in fact, four. I'll look that up some more just to make sure, but I'm pretty sure that this one is, is in fact, four sig figs. And then this is exact, the one calorie. So what do we have to round our answer to? How many sig figs? Three. So we start from the left, one, two, three. That means I have to round to this place. So I want to pose the rounding question a little different. Is 2,092 closer to 2,090 or 2,100? Can you rephrase that? 2,092. Is it closer to 2,090 or 2,100? 2,090. So I'm looking at this two, and I need to round it to 2,090 joules, which is ambiguous. So an easy way to do that is just put the line under it. You could do scientific notation if you wanted, but you also could just put the line. All right. Um, let me do a, one other example for you. How many capital C calories are in 7,075, let's say 15 joules? So let's do a little road map on this because I'm noticing that this is the big calories. I know a conversion for joules to little calories, and then I could convert little calories to food calories. So it's a two-step process. What's my given? Yep, that's my given. And my want is this big calories. This is what I want. So I put my given 7,515 joules. Notice I do the abbreviation when I actually do the math. My conversion factor, well, I want joules to be on the bottom, right? I want joules on the bottom, little calories on the top, because I'm converting right now from joules to calories. I know that there are 4.184 joules <coughs> in every one little calorie. Now I have to do another conversion that compares big calories to little calories. So which one is it? Which one's bigger? The big calories. It wins the one. The big guy wins. And there are 1,000 little calories in one food calorie. So if you notice here, I did a two-step conversion. Right? Here's conversion number one, and here's conversion number two. And I've done it in all one fell swoop. I check my units. Joules cancel. Little calories cancel. I'm left in big calories. Oh, good, because that's what I wanted. Now I do the math. 7515 times 1 times 1. Who cares? I don't have to do that. Divided by 4.184 and divided by 1,000. So could someone do that math for me? All those phones and calculators. Let's see what you get. What do you, so 7,515 divided by 4.184 and divided by 1,000. What would you get? 1.7961. All right. And Gabe, you second that? Yeah. All right. And you do too? All right. So now let's look at our SIG fix. 
look at our sig figs. So this one has four sig figs. I think we've determined that this is four sig figs. This is exact. And one to 1,000, do we do the metric? Because this is actually a, a regular calorie to a kilocalorie. Are those exact or do we count them? Anybody know? Okay, those are all exact. Anytime you convert, like kilo, centi, deci, mega, all of those are always exact. So we don't count them. So it looks like four sig figs it is. So we start at the left, one, two, three, four. I got to round to this place. So I look at the one. That one tells me to leave the six alone. 1.796, and the units are large calories. That is a very, that's almost like, I don't know, chewing gum. 1.796 calories. I don't know, one bite of celery. That's how much that is. A very small amount of energy. On last night's homework, which I now push to tonight's homework, this is how I'd like you to set it up. Using this cross hash, it's called dimensional analysis or factor label method. It's, it's really helpful when you're trying to get your units to cancel. Yeah. If you didn't do it like that and you've already done it, yeah. then leave it how it is. Okay. Yeah. I don't want you to redo. All right. So let's move down into types of energy. And really, there's only two types of energy. Potential energy. We abbreviate that PE. And the second type is kinetic energy. And that's it. What I'd like you to do on your own, next to this, maybe on the right-hand side of your page. I would like you to write down examples of what you know, potential versus kinetic. You could also write down questions that you might have or where you've heard of the term kinetic energy before versus potential energy. And right now it's just private think time, and it's just a quick write. It's like jotting down what you know, questions and or what you know about potential energy and kinetic energy. And in like two minutes, I'm going to have you share with your group. So just quietly write to yourself. Go ahead and discuss amongst each other what you know about energy, potential, kinetic. Discuss at your table mates. Huh? No, the regular class agenda. 
I'll upload it to YouTube. And then I've noticed a couple people also have, have subscribed to my YouTube channel. Yeah, so I think when I update, it triggers whatever it does. What does it tell you? There's a new video. Yeah. Yeah, why? All right, so let's come back together. Yeah, Maya. Yeah. Yeah, those are Newton's cradle, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, the, you guys are not hearing the kinetic energy when you drop the ball and it's swinging, it hits the other core, and then it swings back up. That's Newton's cradle. That's a great example of the Yeah, potential is you holding the ball. So if you hold it just up a little bit, you'll notice when it it hits, the other one just goes up a little bit. If you hold it a lot, then it's more energy. Good. So where you hold it up, there's more. Abby, I heard you say something. Is it potential energy? Stored energy. Yeah. Is it potential energy stored energy? So yeah, I mean... This has potential energy. <laughs> what am I going to do for fifth period? I'm going to eat this. Right? This has stored energy. Maybe I'll save some of my almonds. That has stored energy. So there's potential energy in this. How do I get the energy? I eat it. And then my body does its thing. It turns it into kinetic energy. This is free energy. Yeah, free energy. Hasn't been used yet. What's some other examples that you guys discussed? Some she said roller coaster. Oh, perfect. Roller coaster. You're up at the very top. Yeah. And you gain energy as you go down. Yeah. Kinetic. Potential is at the top. Kinetic is it's changing. Remember, energy is conserved. So as you get to the top, you have all this energy stored ready to go, and then you start falling, and that potential energy is getting converted into kinetic energy. All right, so what I'd like to do is talk to you about the different types of energy because we have talked about mechanical energy. Mechanical energy is like Newton's cradle where you hold up the ball and drop it or I um, hold up the, uh, the, or the roller coasters up at the top and it falls down. So that's a type of mechanical energy. There's a paper right here that says pass. Yeah, that one. That one. And then food energy. Food energy is kind of interesting. It's actually thermal energy. And if you think about thermal energy, we just learned about thermal energy. Remember when we talked about the more kinetic energy we add to particles, what happens to their behavior? They go faster. Good. If I eat an apple, the particles in my body have the energy now to move around and have my functions happen. All life functions happen because of energy, specifically movement of particles. And it's kind of weird to think of food as thermal energy. But in a way, it is. Our body is burning calories right now as we're sitting here. You can burn more calories by more movement. You can burn less calories by less movement. And then also all of your life processes require that energy. So that is, in a, in a sense, thermal energy. What about a log? Just a piece of wood in your dining room or living room right by the fireplace. That's potential. Then you put it in your fireplace and you light it. And it's converting that potential energy into kinetic in the form of thermal. Right? It's got thermal energy. And then the last one that I think is really quite important is electrical energy. Electrical energy. So there is something called the Upper American River Project, Upper American <coughs> River Project. The Upper American River Project was developed by SMUD in the 1950s. 
So basically, you've got Lake Tahoe up here, and you've got snow. Oops, that's not snom. That's funny. Snow. Okay, so you've got your mountain top. That's my Lake Tahoe mountain top. And you've got all this snow up here, and what ends up happening is you've got water flowing down from Lake Tahoe. And as it flows down from Lake Tahoe, what happens in various places is it moves a turbine. A turbine is like a big fan. So as this water flows over it, the turbine turns, and that is mechanical energy. The top of the mountain with all the snow is potential energy. And as it's starting to flow, it's converting that potential energy into mechanical en energy. Now, this mechanical en energy has a battery or generator of some sort. And what it does is it converts the mechanical energy into electrical energy. And that electrical energy here, let's let's build our little apartment building. Here's our, all of our little apartments that we live in. And those are converted to things like heat and air conditioning, right? So thermal energy or the lack of thermal energy. It's also converted to light. It's converted to sound, our radio, our TVs, um, maybe our ovens, our phone chargers, our computers, our electric blankets, whatever it is we need for electricity, um, this is how it's created. Now the <coughs> Upper American River Project, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about it because it's very unique. Could something, oh, in fact, I want to show you, let's look. Oh, here, I was searching Upper American River Project. So some pictures of this. Can we see this picture? Okay, that is, what's this one? The uppermost storage reservoir of the Upper American River Project. This is Loon Lake. Has anyone actually been to Loon Lake and gone camping? Yeah, you have? Yeah, it's beautiful up there, obviously. Look at that. So let's see if we can see some other pictures. Um, this one's not showing much. Let's look at this map. Oh, dag. Let's see if I can do it. Nah, it's, it's what I call tree porn. It won't let me look at the forest. <laughs> Um, let's look at this picture right here. This picture right here is a dam. This is the South Fork of the American River. So what it is is it's holding all that reservoir into a lake. So if you notice, we in our lifetime, including my own, I wasn't alive during the 50s. Maybe even some of your parents weren't alive during the 50s. Maybe it's your grandparents. But prior to then, <laughs> you guys have all been or heard of uh, Old Sack, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> Old Sack has an underground area and they built up. If you've noticed, you can actually take a tour of the underground Old Sacramento. And what happened prior to 1950s is um, it flooded all of the time. And it was a pain in the butt for people. They didn't like it being flooded. And so they had to build Old Sacramento up, and that's why there's buildings on top of a whole underground kind of area. Well, it wasn't, and that was where most of the people lived prior to 1950s. I mean, they lived around areas, but what was a pain 
is that every flood season, which is, you know, every rainy season, streets will be flooded, um, homes will be flooded. It was just awful. So SMUD, Sacramento Municipal Utility District, worked with the Upper American River Project and said, hey, what if we build a series of reservoirs, lakes, for people to go camping at, they can go boating, they can go fishing, we can kind of preserve the wildlife in that area but make it recreation, then we can build these dams to hold the lakes, and then when we need electricity, we can let the water flow, and that water flow will go down, turn a turbine to generate electricity. So there are a series of dams and reservoirs along with water flow to help, first of all, generate electricity, but secondly, stop the flooding from happening. Now, recently, we are, we're kind of getting out of a drought. There was one year it was particularly horrible, and there was very little snowpack. Snowpack is all up in the highest parts of the Sierras where the snow is literally packed and it doesn't melt until May, June, July. That May, June, and July runoff is what turns these turbines. Well, there was like no snow as of April one year. It was just hardly anything. So that means that we don't get to generate electricity this way. What is a positive about generating electricity this way? Yeah. For the most part, natural, meaning there are no emissions, no carbon emissions specifically. Does anyone know how electricity is generated just normally? Yeah. Burning fuel. Perfect. In Sacramento, in 2012, SMUD completely weaned itself off of all coal. Coal is probably one of the worst things to burn because not only does it put out carbon emissions, it puts out nitrate emissions and sulfate emissions. Nitrates and sulfates, they cause all types of acid rain. They're really harmful for agriculture and natural um, environments. But carbon emissions is a real problem. So yay, for SMUD, they all went to what's called natural gas. So why don't we add to our um, little picture here Oops, hold on. There it is. So another way that we could turn a turbine is burn fuel. And that fuel could be um, coal or natural gas, CH4. And as of 2012, about 50 to 55 percent of all of our electricity actually comes from natural gas. We still have to burn things. About 30% of our natural gas, of our electricity comes from water flowing. And you're right, it makes no emissions. Now, in the 1950s, we didn't have as much regulations. Do you think it wasn't that great for little critters that lived here? Let me get out of the other one. What about all the critters that lived up in the Upper American River Project? And all of a sudden, you've got water flowing, and boom, never mind. There's this big, huge cement thing, and now there's a lake. Do you think there was a huge environmental impact? Yeah, big environmental impact. In fact, in the early 2000s, they were having to renew their license to have this. And there was a lot of environmentalists that were like, no, we have to go back to the natural state. And scientists were like, but wait a minute, this is now their current natural state. If we go back to flowing, you're going to disrupt the organisms that live there because they've now adapted and changed, moved, or died. So it was a big, long process for SMUD to get their re license renewed for the Upper American River Project. And their argument was, we provide Sacramentans 30% of their energy without carbon emissions. Think about, about that benefit. And it is a huge benefit, although we are dependent upon the weather. So we're dependent upon the flow and the snowpack. So climate change is a real issue just for, and you probably don't even think about it, for our electricity production. Now, other things, other things that could get a turbine to turn, and in our local area, you may have seen them as you're driving to San Francisco, or maybe you're going to San Jose, and those are turbines. So we also could turn this turbine with wind. 
So Denmark originally was the country that um, made turbines, and they realized that because Denmark is a windy place, and Holland, all of the Scandinavian countries, lots of wind. And so, and they're also pretty environmental there. And they understood that if you turn something wind, then you can generate electricity with a battery. So what happens, the battery, there's like copper and things moving around. Um, so they designed those wind components to wind energy. You've got, oh, okay. Um, so anyways, we've got wind, and fortunately, China has worked very closely with Denmark and the Scandinavian countries, because China is a fantastic place to manufacture things inexpensively. And so what they did is that we've all worked together to generate all of those wind turbines that are on 580 going towards San Jose, and then there's also some in the Fairfield area as well. Now, is there an environmental impact of those? Absolutely. We've got raptors, so hawks, eagles, vultures. All of our large birds are affected by those. And where do they live? In windy places, right? The California condor that we started this whole project with, those birds are protected birds by the Endangered Species Act. So these wind turbines have strategically been placed so that way they mitigate killing the birds. Because what happens is, you don't even realize it, but the tips of those windmills are going about 200 miles an hour. When you see them, they're just like rotating like this. If you did the math and how big they are, 200 miles an hour, if a bird flies into that or gets pulled into that, yeah, it's mush. And so you have to be careful with the wind. One last thing about energy production. We live in the ring of fire. So the ring of fire maybe you've heard of it, is the Amer you've heard of it? Yeah, oh, it's not a Johnny Cash song. Well, it is a Johnny Cash song, but it's also something else. So if you look at the west coast of the Americas, northern and southern and central, and you look at the east coast of Russia, you've got the Philippine Islands, you've got Japan, you have Hawaii in the middle, there are a series of volcanoes that harness and have all of this, what they call geothermal energy and it's heat underneath the ground. Napa, Calistoga area has a ton of it. SMUD is gonna be working with Calistoga area to harness that heat. If you have heat, you can turn a turbine because heat moves air, because that means the particles are moving faster, and if they're moving, they can move a turbine. So the other way that you can do this is what we call geothermal. So SMUD, I said about 50 some odd percent, let's, let's say 55 percent is natural gas burning something, right, that Nathan reminded us of, the old school way to make electricity. But then the other half is generated mostly by, by large hydro, Upper American River Project. We've got geothermal, we've got wind, and the last thing, which is kind of weird, and it falls directly into here, our solar panels. Solar panels are the only way to generate electricity without turning a turbine. It takes sun's energy and quickly converts it into electrical energy uh, by exciting electrons. It's like this cool, unique way. It uses silicone and boron and phosphorus, and you create these solar panels. In fact, South Elk Grove, you guys might see some solar panel farms. Um, they're just like big land of farms, even Cal Expo and where the Republic, um, Sac Republic plays, those have solar panels to help shade cars. Um, those are tricky too because anytime they're close to a river, they affect the mating patterns of birds though because they're shiny. Yeah, I know. It's like who thought of solar panels affecting like an owl mating and why are we worried about that? Well, it's all part of the ecosystem, so it is something to worry about. All right, you okay. guys. Um, hopefully you can do tonight's homework a little bit easier if you already did it. Thank you. Otherwise, you have another day.